بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم فرینڈز آف دا ڈار لیڈیز اینڈ جینٹل مین گڈ ایوننگ ٹو نائٹس لیکچر ڈیلز ود اے سینچری اولڈ کانٹروورسی اٹ ڈیلز ود دا لائف آف گرٹرڈ بیل اینڈ ہیر افیکٹ آن دا مڈل ایسٹ دیر ہیز بین considerable debate on Miss Bell, both her contemporaries and by later scholars. On the one hand, there is the romantic story of the brave, Oxford-educated, independent English woman traveling on Camelback, exploring remote areas speaking fluent Arabic and self-taught Persian to confer with tribal leaders while she learned conclusive details about the local cultures. All this, she insisted, qualified her as a consultant to the British Empire to draw the border the border lines rather, and carve out new national identities on proposed states in the area. On the other hand, even her close friends deferred with her sharply. They felt that bringing into power a non-Iraqi king was problematic and that she was too romantic, that she only believed what she wanted. They cautioned that her command of Arabic was overrated and that she had little interest in Arab women or home life, let alone Islam itself handicapping her and making objective assessments. Later, scholars have accused her of creating instability in the Middle East. Tonight, Ms. Alison Sean Price will be contributing her voice to the debate. This will be the fifth in her series, The Middle East and Victoria's Women. She's no stranger to our cultural seasons, as she has presented lectures on Freya Stark and Um Saud Dixon in previous years. Our hardship, or one hardship, that none of the women portrayed in her series endured there were no mobile phones and to any of them. So to eliminate the buzz these phones do during her lecture, please make sure you turn them off and let's welcome Ms. Allison Shane Price. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, salam alaikum, welcome. It is a pleasure to present to you the fifth lecture in the series, The Middle East and Victoria's Women. I'll be talking about the extraordinary Gertrude Bell. I am indebted tonight to Sheikha Hussa al-Salam al-Sabah and the Dar al athar al-Islamiya, not only for their support of my research, which is ongoing, but also on their docent training, which has taught me all about the history of the region and about the Al-Sabah collection. So much so that my 35 years in this region has been enriched knowing about this unparalleled area. And this Christmas, I made sure that my whole family went to see the exhibition at the British Museum on Assyrian art. And here are just a few photographs that I took, so please forgive me as I am an amateur photographer. My ongoing journey has taken me into the archives of some of the top 
and most prestigious universities to read original letters, attend seminars, and learn a little bit about archaeology and anthropology. And through my ongoing performances, introduce to audiences a living history of these intrepid explorers. The most important thing that I have learned so far is that I have no right to impose myself, my 21st century political correctness and ethical views on those of another era or culture, which I admit at certain times is quite difficult. I've had to accept that people and events are products of their time and circumstance, and vice versa. That an ordinary person can break through the barrier of conformity and become extraordinary. My viewpoints were turned through 180 degrees. For instance, I believed that before gaining the vote in 1912, all British women were victims of a patriarchal society, especially those desiring to be taken seriously in exploration. As this punch entry in 1893 suggests, a lady, an explorer, a traveler in skirts. The notion's just a trifle too seraphic. Let them stay and mind the babies and mend our ragged shirts, but they mustn't can't and shan't be geographic. I discovered that by 1893, our journey women would have been astonished if they'd been told that they couldn't do something. Their very upbringing had been in the pursuit of excellence. From an early age, each had played competitive sports, traveled extensively, mountaineered and documented every detail in their copious diaries and letters to their home. Whilst mothers organized connections in literary circles for the meeting of minds and future husbands. It came as a great surprise to discover that my progressive father, who encouraged and conjoled me through the late 20th century, was not unique. And that very many women account their father as their greatest supporter of learning and liberty. They hire university professors as tutors and add politicians, diplomats, and explorers to the guest list. A new kind of woman, strong, stoic, resourceful, and determined, was born, and the world was open for travel. With the steam engine powering train and shipping, and young men abroad opening new frontiers. Immigration organizations sprung up throughout London. Travel and employment agencies were big business. Travel books on how to survive and what to wear for every event were readily bought by women of all classes desiring a new life. The travelogue was the best seller of the day, and none more than a pilgrimage of Nejd and tribes of the Euphrates by Lady Anne Blunt, daughter of mathematician Ada Lovelace, student of Mary Somerville, the first woman to be admitted to the Royal Astrological Society, and friend and benefactor of the hospitals of Florence Nightingale, who in, who in 1878 had explored Syria under the Ottoman Empire and crossed the desert to Hale in 1879 with her husband. In her pursuit to learn about the land and its people, Lady Anne became fluent in Arabic and bought to breed and successfully race southern Arabian horses. Lady Anne spent her last years at her home in Egypt. Imagine my delight in the first photograph, when I saw that there was a photograph in Syria in 1907 of, of uh, Lady Anne taken by Gertrude Bell. I wonder what they talked about. And all the, the talks that were given by the ladies before her, did they contribute to that discussion? 
And can we not, by our discussion together, no matter what country we come from, no matter what age, inspire each other? Gertrude Margaret Lothian Bell was born at Washington New Hall in County Durham on the 14th of July, 1868. Her grandfather, Sir Isaac Bell, educated in science in Edinburgh and Subon, owner of the Bell's Brothers Iron and Steel Works and a member of Parliament. And her father, Hugh, equally educated and determined to force social change for the poverty-stricken working class and three times mayor, devoted much time and education on the young Gertrude. On the death of her mother, Hugh married Lady Florence, a successful London playwright and a children's author, who provided love, lessons in duty, an extended family, and the necessary London chaperone in her mother, Lady Olaf, who Gertrude went to stay with during her time as one of the first female students at Lady Margaret Hall, Oxford University. So new was it to admit women into the university that one professor demanded that all the girls turn their backs to him when he taught them. In her book, Recollected in Tranquility, Janet Hogarth, Gertrude's best friend and sister of archaeologist David Hogarth, wrote of Gertrude's student years, and we are able to see exactly what she was like. A vivid, untidy, auburn-haired girl took our hearts by storm. She threw her untiring energy into every phase of student life. She swam, she rode, played tennis, hockey, danced, spoke in debates and told us about modern authors, most of whom were her childhood friends. Yet all the time, she put in seven hours of work per day and won as brilliant a first-class degree in the School of Modern History as ever has been won at Oxford. And that was despite the fact that she argued with her examiner in her viva voce. Gertrude had the world at her feet, but she became the epitome of the modern woman, a blue stocking, an intellectual with an opinion. The second greatest fear of every Victorian mother. To remove her Oxfordiness, Florence sent Gertrude to stay with her sister, Lady Mary Lassells, and her husband, Sir Frank, ambassador to Bucharest, where, sat next to a senior diplomat, she offered her forthright opinion on the troubles of his country and what he could do to improve them. Despite her terrible social and potentially political embarrassment, excused by her age, and in this time, her gender, in 1892, she was again invited by Lady Mary to Sir Frank's new posting in Tehran, for which she was prepared by learning Persian. She wrote a letter to her Karen Horace from Gula Hek. Dear Horace, I never knew what the desert was like at all. It's really wonderful to see it. And suddenly, in the middle of it all, out of nothing springs a garden. And what a garden! Trees, fountains, roses, and a house in it. The houses which we heard of in fairy tales when we were little, inlaid with tiny slabs of looking glass in lovely patterns. Blue tiled floors, carpets strewn with cushions. Here since the enchanted prince. His house is yours. His garden is yours. Better still, his tea and fruit are yours. So are his kellians, but I think kellians are a horrid form of smoke. They are mostly charcoal and paint mixed. Very well out of his own kindness. Ices are served and coffee, after which you ride home refreshed, charmed, and with many blessings on your fortunate head. And all the time, your host was probably a perfect stranger into whose privacy you forced yourself upon in this unblushing way. We have no such hospitality in the West and no manners. I felt ashamed almost. I felt ashamed before the beggars in the street. They wear their rags with a better grace 
than I, my most becoming habit. Gertrude rode every morning at 5 a.m., improving her passion and making copious notes, which led to the publishing of her first extremely well-accepted travelogue, Safa Namur, Persian Pictures, 1894. She wrote in a romantic style and described with wonder the monuments, the customed, the veiled women, the lives of the town and bazaar, cholera outbreaks, the deserts and desert dwellers, and accompanied them with photographs. Her readers were transported. However, a poignant statement depicts her developing observation. As the procession of people flies past you, you realize what a gulf lies between you. The East looks to itself. It asks nothing of you or your civilization. A belief that Gertrude was to retain for the rest of her life. In Persia, Gertrude fell madly in love for the first time with Henry Godogan, a young diplomat who she went riding with and shared a love of literature and poetry, especially the poet Hafiz. They could not get Hugh's permission to marry. As he gave the excuse, he could not afford the upkeep of two households, but in truth, Sir Frank had informed him of Henry's gambling debts. Gertrude went home immediately, not speaking to her uncle for two years, her sadness being compounded by Henry's death from cholera six months later. In her sorrow, she wrote Divan al Hafez, published in 1897, a translation of the poems they read together. And here is an excerpt from it. Thus saith the poet, When death comes to you, O ye whose life sand through the hourglass slips, he lays two fingers on your eyes, two upon your ears, and he lays one upon your lips, whispering, Silence, although death thine ear, thine eye, my hafiz, suffers time's eclipse. It is impossible to deny the effect the East has on a Westerner's philosophy. A theme that runs through the writings is that to be present is what matters in Arabia. And whoever shares the present is important to know. In this moment, Friendship and trust is established. In her letters home to Florence from Berlin two years later, having relented to visit her uncle and his new post as ambassador to Berlin, she talks of balls and theatre visits and a visit to the Kaiser Wilhelm, the first emperor of the United Germany. We had an agreeable visit with the emperor and empress, and while we were having tea, Sheets of telegrams were handed to the emperor. He and Uncle Frank felt that they must have an excited conversation. We talked on, pretending not to hear, but could not deny the scraps of Crete, Bulgaria, Serbia, mobilizing. He is persuaded we are all on the brink of war. At this time, war was over there. Taught to children in schools, that it was fought by professional soldiers. It didn't touch the ordinary lives of the British people. As Gertrude turned 30, she turned her eyes once more to the east, first to Jerusalem, arriving on the Russian ship SS Russia with 400 peasants making pilgrimage. She talked to nearly all of them using sign language. And this shows you that Gertrude Bell wanted to know about the people. Her essence was, tell me about you, I would tell you about me. We will become friends. And she remembered everything. They bring their own beds and onions and undergo terrible hardships. On arrival, as was custom, she called on Mrs. Dixon at the British consulate and met her charming 11-year-old son, Harold, later to be the political agent of Kuwait. The main purpose of her journey was to learn Arabic, which she found excruciatingly difficult, and I really can empathize with her. I do try. 
The pronunciation is plus words. No Western throat is constructed to make this extraordinary gutturals. There are five names for wall and 36 ways to say a plural. I will never get the hang of it. Compounded with the fact that every region speaks its own version. And already she is noticing that although the region is Arabia, there are so many different types of people and culture in this very vast region. For Gertrude, failure was not an option, and she employed local girls, such as Farida Yamsha, to converse with and train her in the customs. Farida took her to her village, and she had to sit and have tea with her mother and her whole extended family. She learned Arabic. Visits to holy sites were for archaeological interests only. However, although an atheist, it renewed her interest in the Old Testament and the Abrahamic religions. While she delighted in walking waist deep through beautiful flowers and eating delicious meals in tents, a soup made of olive oil and rice, mutton stew and raisins, her observations were moving away from the romantic style of her youth and becoming more philosophical. Beyond the fountain, the road was empty. I was struck by the incredible desolation of it. No life, no flowers, bare stalks of last year's thistles, bare hills and stony road. And yet, this wilderness has been nurse to the very fiery spirit of man. Gertrude's first love was archaeology, and she quickly distinguished herself from the normal traveller. She would spend hours studying a ruin and gave specific attention to detailing of her documentation. So writes Dr. Lisa Cooper, author of In Search of Kings and Queens. Her academic style of writing was developed under the tutelage of Savant Solomon Renoche, editor of the Revue de Archaeologique in Paris, between her travels. He invited her to review the archaeological papers of new discoveries for his magazine. In a letter to her mother, dated on the 8th of November, 1904, she states in admiration, he does nothing but work, except to go out and see a distant museum. Consequently, he knows everything. Could Gertrude be describing her own future? Her 1905 journey through Syria and Palestine, creating the persona of El Khartoum, is documented in her book, Desert and the Sound. I wanted to write an account of the people, the people I met and who accompanied me on my way, and to show how it appears to them. It is better that they tell their tale. I've strung their words together, I heard them. The shepherd boy, the man at arms, around the campfire, in the black tent of the desert, and the guest chamber of the Druze, and the cautious utterings of the Ottoman's official. Travelling through the Ottoman Empire as a lone woman, required guides, muleteers, and servants to carry luggage, food, tents, and her tin bath. Gertrude's caravan on camels and horses gave her the appearance of a queen, not for her the saddlebag and hard floor of Freya Stark. Gertrude dressed for dinner with silver candlesticks on her table and a full of dinner surface. She never went without a corset and was famous for wearing multiple divided skirts, which Violet Dixon remembers that she would remove periodically. Often dressed in outer men's Arab clothing, which Lady Anne preferred. She was prepared for all weathers, and met all weathers. Gertrude knew that the Ottomans were watching her. She was becoming a concern for them. Although cordial with Great Britain, the Ottomans were having closer links to Germany, who were, one, training their army, two, paying their debts, three, planning a Berlin to Baghdad railway, which included mineral rights and land for German farmers. 
by using her charm, Gertrude persuaded the Viliat Pashas, of which there were three, Mosul, Baghdad, and Basra, to give her the protection of a soldier through dangerous areas. She carried a gun hidden in her clothes, and at the assistance of her doctor, morphine, to use when all else failed. And Gertrude had two objectives, to visit unrecorded archaeological ruins and to familiar herself with desert tribes. The latter she managed with great success by sending her trusted servant Fatah to the tents of desert sheikhs and inviting them to dinner and cigarettes in her tent, lit by candlelight, wearing formal dress. An invitation to the sheikh's tent to meet his tribe was always forthcoming, and presents exchanged. Gertrude received the sheikh's protection to pass through areas outside the Ottoman Empire and the long-life friendship, which would prove invaluable in the near future, began. She now is a mature 40-year-old, and at all times, even when the sheikhs visited her tent, Fatou was by her side. He was by her side in her meetings with such great sheikhs as Mubarak the Great of Kuwait and Abdelaziz in Ben Saud, who she admired greatly, and Ibn Rashid, who she did not after her mistreatment by his family. Defying the Ottomans by leaving without informing them of her every move. In her diary of a journey to Hill, on 16th of January, she writes to her special friend, Captain Charles Doherty White, I have cut the thread. I am an outlaw. It would please them to send me a bullet. In 1907, she funded an exhibition of William Ramsey to excavate an early Christian site, Binbur Kishel. It was a study of post-classical monuments. Bell and Ramsey wrote, a thousand and one churches, which hailed her as a respective archaeologist. In the same year, in Babylon, she visited the site of the German Archaeological Institute under license from the Ottoman Empire, led by expert Robert Kudowi, who conducted modern scientific excavation. Unlike the British Museum, between 1879 and 1882, who prepared the site, and had little experience in excavating mud bricks within tells, false hills in which were layers of cities rebuilt, covered in dust and earth. Gertrude stated that all we did as British archaeologists was dig trenches and everything sank if they were mud bricks. She learned much from Robert. Robert carefully excavated Ishtar's gate the procession way, and the ziggurat of Marduk, carefully labeling them for restoration. And in Germany, the Pergamon Museum in Berlin now houses these reconstructed gates, bringing to the world the history of Babylon that would not have been known. In 1922, Violet Dixon's book, 40 Years in Kuwait, states that Violet recounts a wonderful tour of the site by Gertrude Bell and on a previous occasion, a tour of Robert's workrooms, left in a hurry in 1914. Files, letters, undeveloped films, photographs, left where they were, covered in dust and pigeon droppings. And I would very much like to know why they left in such a hurry. On her travels, Gertrude created maps of previously uncharted areas and shared them with the Royal Geographical Society, receiving the fellowship of the Royal Geographical Society in 1913 and its prestigious Founders Medal in 1918. Her photographs and papers are housed in all the world's archives and most importantly in Newcastle University, which has recently been recognized by UNESCO as a collection of global importance. Her records of the antiquities of Mosul, destroyed by ISIS, are of particularly great importance. On July 24, 1908, the Young Turks, soldiers and academics who had seen the modernization of the world overthrew the Sultan and the sublime port, the seat of the Ottoman government. 
Newspapers sprung up everywhere. Op opinions were spoken in public. Restrictions lifted. A constitutional government occurred. And this encouraged rebellion. Nationalistic fever grew in Arabia. In her book of travels, Amrath to Amrath, Gertrude's tone had totally changed. There was a new note. For the first time in all the turbulent centuries to which this desolate region bears witness, a potent word has gone forth. And those who had caught it listened in amazement, asking one another what it meant. Liberty. But what is liberty? It fell from the lips of the Bedouin. It foretold change. That sense of change, uneasy and bewildered, hung over the whole of the Ottoman Empire. And I cannot present, pretend to be indifferent in this matter. I have drawn too heavily upon the goodwill of the people to regard their fortunes with a, an impartial detachment. I should be doing a disservice to the people who have given me so full a measure of hospitality and fellowship if I was to underestimate the problems that lie before them. The victories of peace are more laborious than those of war. They demand a higher integrity and finer conception of citizenship than any which has been current here. The old tyranny has lifted, but it has left its shadow. The five months of journey, which are recounted in the book, were months of suspense and at times terror. Constitutional government trembled in the balance. It was like to be outweighed by the forces of disorder, fanaticism, massacre, and civil strife. At crucial times of tension, the First World War began in August 1914 in Europe, and many experts have discussed this period and time, but where did Gertrude fit into it? We last saw her as a traveler, archaeologist, and writer. At the beginning of the war, she offered her knowledge and services to the government as Middle Eastern advisor and was immediately turned down. She threw herself into the Red Cross to become a nurse and reorganized the administration of her unit, especially the communication system between the families and their missing soldiers. At one time, she received 1,900 letters and tried to answer them all. With the Ottoman Empire on the side of Germany, the Near East was immediately designated a hot spot. In 1915, the Arab Bureau was formed under David Hogarth, and Gertrude and T.E. Lawrence recruited to give a comprehensive profile of the region. They met previously on a dig in the Hittite city of Karkamish in 1909 and respected each other. On March the 3rd, 1916, Gertrude was rushed to Basra to advise Sir Percy Cox, CPO of Mesopotamia, and became the liaison officer over the British advance in a region she knew better than anyone. She drafted accurate maps that assured safe passage to Baghdad in recognition she was named Oriental Secretary. Safe passage to Baghdad was guaranteed because of Gertrude's friendship with the sheikhs. Here you see Ibn Saud. And this is Sir Percy Cox in 1916. The sheikhs came to ask Gertrude what to do, and they had been offered great bribes by the Ottomans in form of gold. They asked her what to do about that. And when she discussed it with them, they told their brothers and their sons and their uncles and their tribes to stop the caravans of trading through certain areas. And therefore, the British government and the British army was allowed to go straight through to Baghdad. She supplied bulletins daily about every single area and every single uh, sheikh. And to quote a superior officer called Mollis, her bulletins gave no attempt to connect how war should move. This was not her directive.
but each described a system, an individual, or a phase in history. Throughout them all can be seen the breadth of her understanding and her sympathy for the people she loved so well. The Arab revolt led by Hussein al-Sharif of Mecca against the Turks in 1916 and backed by the British brought the war to the desert. Lawrence used her information to decide on his battle plans. Leading tribes into battle, he became Lawrence of Arabia and his memoirs are written in the book Seven Pillars of Wisdom. I would advise you to read that. It might not be what you think. As the statue was well known among sheikhs, her reputation grew, and so did their respect. It is spoken of the great sheikh drawing support for the British by saying, my brothers, you have heard what this woman has to say, as she is only a woman. But by Allah, she is a mighty and valiant one. Now we know that women are inferior to men. If the women of the Inglesi are like her, the men must be lions. In strength and in valor, we'd better make peace with them. In 1917, imagine the scene met by Gertrude and the incoming British as they went into Baghdad. Georgina Howell, in her book, Daughter of the Desert, details this due to her extensive research. The water was cut off from desert towns. Crops failed. The plague and typhoid had taken its toll. Dead bodies scattered the streets, and they had to be buried. Sanitation had to be created. Ruins of the holy sites and the houses had to be rebuilt. The Ottomans had followed a scorched earth policy. They'd ate their grain and burnt everything else as they passed through. Canals were stopped up to make way for Ottoman railways and roads. The Mosul Road was closed, and that stopped the trade. In the cities alone, in the winter of 1917 to 1918, 10,000 people died of starvation. So Britain set up creating administration under Gertrude's liaisons, brought in experts from India to create sanitation, built 50 hospitals, an isolation hospital and an x-ray center, opened a girls' school where previously only Sunni boys were allowed to be educated. Pilgrim corpses were repatriated. People were paid for the first time for their manpower and their produce. And landowners were registered with the added problem that they didn't know their address or their boundaries. And at one time, 21 families appeared to own one date tree. Chlorinated water was introduced and pest control. And the plague was eradicated. The sheikhs became rich. And local dealers who broke the rules were dealt with by the sheikhs. By 1917, the USA was in the war and demanded full account of battle plans. Woodrow Wilson proposed a 14-point system to bring peace to the world. It demanded a totally different system to be put into place, where victors would selflessly aid the losers in their regrowth and development until they could govern themselves. It turned imperialism on its head and was the basis of the League of Nations. Mandate holders would be responsible for the collection of heavy war debts imposed on the losers. Therefore, the country themselves had to pay the debts. Arnold Wilson asked Gertrude to write a paper on self-determination, which took 10 months. And then she said, how? How can a country govern themselves with no army, no police force, no understanding of constitutional government, no revenue, and no money. The British provided seed, money, and irrigation. And finally, there was enough corn to be able to feed everyone and the Kurds and the desert dwellers. In 1921, Sir, Wilson, Sir Winston Churchill caused... Sir Winston Churchill called for a conference at Cairo to create borders and unify the country under a proposed king. Gertrude had voiced her concerns 
very strongly about sovereignty. She did not believe that there should be a king of a united nation. However, she was a minor in this play, and she supported giving a choice, Faisal ibn Hussein, as regent. But he proved not to be the leader the new country of Iraq needed at such a time, regardless of her mentorship. In this conference, Gertrude asked every sheikh exactly what his boundary would be when she was talking about and determining boundaries. And please remember, she was a woman. The vote had just been given, and she had superiors. And it is quite interesting that one decides to put everything on one person. Surely, it was the decision of the country to do exactly what they did. Gertrude's health started to rapidly deteriorate. Her photographs show her to be deathly thin. Her diaries mention spending Christmas in bed, recurring malaria and pleurisy, put her into hospital, where she woke every morning to work daily from her hospital bed. Archaeology began again. Excavations were resuming. Leonard Woolley, whom Bell met in the Arab Bureau, led a joint expedition at the British Museum and the University of Pennsylvania to Ur, beginning in 1922, which included his wife, the British archaeologist Catherine Woolley. There they made important discoveries, including the copper bull and the bull-headed lyre, in the course of excavating the royal cemetery. Agatha Christie's novel, Murder in Mesopotamia, was inspired by the discovery of the royal tombs. Christie later married Woolley's young assistant and took part in the digs. Worried that the antiquities would be removed from Iraq, Gertrude persuaded King Faisal to make her the honorary director of the Museum of Antiquities. She produced the first legislation of the law of antiquities, awarding license permits and surveying sites as long as a percentage of the fines would be given to the museum. She detailed and documented them all. The plan was that a room in a palace would be replaced by a building in Baghdad. On her final journey home that summer in 1924, Janet Hogworth met her. She described her as incredibly ill, thin and white-haired. With deep fears about her health, the family pleaded with her to stay. She refused although cancer was suggested. A life of impossible living conditions, working constantly in high temperatures exceeding 120 degrees throughout the summer without air conditioning, bad air and continual smoking made this possible. Pleurisy in itself is incredibly painful. She refused to listen. For her, Iraq was everything. The people of Iraq were her people. When she returned to Baghdad, she put her house in order and asked a friend to care for her dog. And on the morning of July the 12th, 1926, she was found dead in her bed, an empty bottle of dial next to her. The reason behind her death has been a cause of much debate. The suicide, because of depression, over her circumstances, did not fit the character of Gertrude Bell. Anybody who knows Victorian women of such sort would not believe that. Therefore, I concluded that the pain was so great that she had overdosed and discussed this with respected women. They immediately informed me of a uniform response, that it was no accident. I asked them why they thought that, and they answered in unison that Gertrude Bell a woman proud of taking her life in her own hands, did exactly that, knowing her worsening condition. Her death was her final decision. A plaque in the museum unveiled in 1926 by King Faisal reads, her memory of the Arabs will always hold in reverence and affection. She created this museum in 1923, being then the honorary director of antiquities for Iraq. With wonderful knowledge and devotion, 
She assembled the most precious of objects in it, and through the heat of the summer worked on them until the day of her death. The principal wing will bear her name. In her will, Gertrude Bell left £6,000 to the founding of a school of archaeology in Baghdad. Iraqi archaeologist Dr. Lama Ware, who reopened the museum after the looting in 2003, was the fifth recipient of the Gertrude Bell Memorial Medal. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening.